Aloha! Welcome to Talk Story with John Waihei. Today we have an exciting guest and he's sitting on the, the side of the table that he's not normally used to. This is Dr. Chad Blair. He is a reporter and all around very important person with Civil Beat, which is probably Hawaii's uh, outstanding political um, newspaper. Or, Thank you. Or, or, or document. I mean, you guys actually pay attention to issues as, a part, as opposed to just writing. But anyway, welcome, Chad. Governor, a pleasure. Thank you. We, we are here to talk about a really important subject for everybody in Hawaii, everybody in the United States, maybe, maybe the world, and that is the freedom of the press. Now, our Constitution, the United States Constitution, and the Hawaii Constitution both guarantee freedom of speech and freedom of press. I um, thought we'd start off by asking, Chad, what is the freedom of press? I mean, what is it? I, I know we have this vague idea that it means something that people can write articles of. What it, you know, in your opinion, what, what is the freedom of uh, press? What does it mean? Well, first of all, thank you for having an enemy of the American people. <laughs> the opposition party. The opposition party yeah. on your show. You know, I used that line the other day, and I'm not done with it yet. I'm going to get some more mileage out well, of I that. I think that's one of your greatest <laughs> credentials. I do, uh, too. Slightly higher than PhD. I agree. <laughs> it, in fact, it's a badge of honor right now. It um, is. Well, what does it mean? It's in the First Amendment, not the right. Fifth, not, not the Twelfth. It's the first thing that the it Founding is. Fathers, uh, yeah. that the freedom of religion and freedom of press. Right, uh, freedom to assemble. Right. And the reason was because they felt a fourth branch of government, although I don't think it was called that at the time of the, the founding, but in addition to the executive, the legislative, and the judicial branches, the three branches, they felt that a free press was essential. And of course... It was you, essential to democracy. Absolutely. And it was brutal back then as it is now. If you look at the Thomas Jefferson, John Adams contest in 1800, there were brutal things being said back and forth, and things about Alexander Hamilton and Aaron Burr. And even Jefferson himself said the newspaper is full of lies. But he also said, I'd rather have a good newspaper, essentially, than a government, because you can't you have can't, government Because uh, without. there's an expectation you know, right. that these newspapers, right. essentially, these these pamphleteers in some cases, exactly, uh, would keep the government honest by reporting on what they did. Thomas right. Paine, common sense. But, okay, way back then there was, I mean, practically every town, every corner, right. there, uh, there was uh, somebody writing something, maybe like uh, similar to the bloggers of today. So, uh, you know, and, but what, what does that freedom of the press mean in this modern era when the press is also a business? Well, it's tough because, as you know, the press is in a whole lot of trouble right now. It's a broken business. The model is no longer working. Advertising, uh, classified. Exactly. And because of that, you're seeing a number of newspapers fold across the country. It happened here. The Honolulu Star Bulletin and the Honolulu Advertiser merged into one paper. And frankly, I think we're a lesser community for it. It was better to have two competing right. newspapers. Well. That doesn't mean journalism is dying. And what has been surprising to me is people like Jeff Bezos or Bezos for right. Amazon buying the Washington Post. People like Pierre Omidyar, uh, the founder of eBay, founding Civil Beat and The Intercept and First Look Media. And now some are even looking towards a nonprofit model to sustain it because it's difficult to get people to pay well, for news. Because you can you turn on your it's free. You, you turn on your TV, right. for example, and you get these line, tiny little s snippets <laughs> of w what's happening in the world. Right. And, and there's no w w the educational aspect doesn't seem to exist. But if you ask me what it means to have a free press, yes. it means you need to have an institution that can say to a president Trump well, how exactly did President Obama wiretap Trump Tower before the election? Can you produce some evidence? And when Senator John McCain follows up and says, yeah, if you can't produce the evidence, then you ought to retract that. This just happened. Who else is going to report that 
except for the press. And you can't rely on a biased media organization like a Fox News, like a Breitbart, like an Infowar to do that. Or, um, <laughs> I used to say, I now believe that the, uh, the idea of a free press, I believe with intensity, but I've always believed that it was an important constitutional amendment. And not, but now, because of our president, I believe that it's even more important. But I, I, at the same time, though, as I was going around saying that we ought to have a free press, I was going to say, but I don't like this particular, <laughs> uh, Red Bart, for example. I, I, I don't like them. Or yeah. I don't like, but a free press encompasses these crazies. They do, and mind you, there are... Is that are a price that we pay, or...? Something changed. We moved out of a society that had three television stations and PBS and daily newspapers. We didn't have the Internet. We didn't have blogs. We didn't have talk radio. And somewhere along the way, particularly in the 90s and the, uh, the early 2000s, we started to go into our own echo chamber. And rather than all of us sharing the same news stories, Nixon resigned, everyone agrees, 1974, right. there wasn't another article saying, Nixon forced out of office by bad dudes. He was a great <laughs> president. Yay, Vietnam. That has changed to where people cannot make the distinction between what is real and what is fake. And for the president to say, you are misbehaving, you are misleading, you are fake, you are dishonest, is really a remarkable turn of events because people were already questioning the media. Because let's face it, we got some things wrong. Right. WMD on Iraq, we called it wrong. Well, it didn't help that the White House at the time was feeding us a bunch of BS. But that's what scares me the most right now is that people, when Trump says something like what he says, it's happening today. The well, Congressional see, Budget Office says, look, Obamacare repeal is going to be... 14 million people are going to lose their jobs. Trump immediately says, nah, that's not true. Not, not true. Not so, true. So who do you believe? Oh, I don't know. But when I ran for office, the press said I was going to lose. So, you know, <laughs> uh, you know who am I supposed to believe? You and know, how that, did the press treat you when you were in office? Well, they treated me, they treated me, uh, I think, um, full on. You know, the way I, I wish that everybody else would, they would treat everybody else. You know, but we also had to help them. We, we passed the, you know, the open records law. Right. Thank which, you. We, which, by the way, made life miserable. Oh, it did. For, for anybody, uh, for me and others in office. But it, it was the essence of what they're, they're there for. What I worry about is you now have a, a president yeah. that says that what we consider to be objective reporting, at, at least within the parameters of objective, is a lie or is wrong or is is in opposition and deliberately uh, says the opposite and the press, his press, follows it. Well, Steve Bannon ran Breitbart. He's right. now the senior advisor. Some people say he's the, the Svengali, yeah. the, the Rasputin, the guy that's really running things back there. Well, this is a big concern. There was a poll just the other day saying that a majority of Democrats still feel that news gets it right and it's fair and if it makes a mistake it corrects it but a majority of Republicans feel that you can't trust the media there's even some indication that they trust Trump more than they do the news that's right more than they trust the idea of a free press now w what I'm leading up to is his secretary of state uh, what's his name? Rex Tillerson yeah Rex Tillerson hasn't held a press conference never won't talk to the press won't let well. the press go with him to Asia won't let him travel as is the custom right but at the same time there's going to be I'm assuming if it's like everything else somebody from the Trump administration feeding news yeah. to Fox yeah so you, you have a little bit more than just taking an opposition view. What you have is the President of the United States, or an administration, actually supporting the business aspects of one of the members of the press. You have Sean Spicer, his press secretary, leaving CNN and the New York Times out of a briefing off camera. That is really remarkable. You having the White House allow these other news I'm going to use these quote marks, these so-called right. news services, to come in there and be treated on the same level as an NPR or a CBS. 
Or exactly. Even, yeah, or even CNN. Now, mind you, MSNBC, I think, has its own biases. There's no question that there's a problem with bias in the media. But how... If well, we can't well, trust the but media... But if you, if you allow government to choose yeah. who listens right. to what, or, you know, talks to uh, what, uh, the people in government, then the, the, the cure, it seems to me, the way to have to achieve objectivity is to have everybody give everybody opportunity to say something. Right. But not everybody has the same value of things to say. And I think what the media does, and I'll admit, sometimes it puts, we put ourselves on a pedestal and we think a little bit like we're going to be the ones that'll make the call. And, and we could learn some humbling from, from all that has happened in the last year and a half. But someone does have to be able to say when something is false. When what the president or oh, Sean Spicer, course. and if that is then taken into doubt by millions or tens of millions of Americans, that's a very serious problem. And I'll point to... Well, I think for politically... That's a very serious problem. I mean, for the, for the American democracy, it's right. a serious problem. I'm what I'm sort of interested in is the fact that after the Secretary of State announced that he was not going to have anybody traveling with him, what the media did, at, at least the mainstream media, was to have a meeting and, and sort of, oh, this is terrible, and but. You know, uh, the reaction didn't seem to have been that, that uh, strong against it. Now, true that on the federal level, there a lot of the access that was granted to reporters was uh, done by custom. It's not necessarily required by law, but it was done by custom. It was thought as this is the American thing to do. This is how our democracy functions, right? But now. All of a sudden, this happens. But he stepped one step further, and that is there was direct government sponsorship of players in the media, of the press. Now, how does a struggling newspaper or a struggling TV station or radio station continue to be the party of the opposition <laughs> when there is their when their competitors are being fed the news. Yeah. Fox doesn't have to go on the plane to Asia. Fox right. will get reports back every day. But somebody uh, CNN might have to. They might have to pay for it. So now you also got an economic um, I think it was Sean Hannity that was essentially flying candidates, maybe Trump on his own plane. You know, Fox actually has a couple of good people. Brett Baer, I think, is fair. Oh, they're, they're, yeah, they Chris are. Wallace is a good oh, reporter. Oh, Chris Wallace is a good I think Megyn Kelly... I wish she hadn't left. Yeah. yeah and no, she was a, uh, uh, having said that, that's a, a, a den of sexual harassment, as we've been seeing since Roger right. Ailes was leaving there. One of the lessons that I've learned, and I, this is coming from a Columbia Journalism Review, as you know, there's a good one of the best journalism schools in the nation there. And the lesson is, maybe we got too close. Maybe the press got too buddy-buddy with the people in power. And I'll have to admit it. Um, I, I, I like politicians. Right. I like you, Governor. Well, thank you. <laughs> and I find you, uh, as long as you're not reporting on me, <laughs> exactly. an excellent person. I love the fact uh, that I have your cell phone but and your email, but maybe it's too close. Now, you're out of office, but... Right. Um, is, do we lose our objectivity when we start thinking of the we'll lawmaker? Come, we'll come back right to that yes. after... Uh, oh, it's a time for a break. A time for a break, yeah. And by the way, folks, call us if you have any questions at 415-871-2474. Thank Aloha. I'm Kawi Lucas, host of Hawaii is My Mainland, here on Think Tech Hawaii every Friday at 3 p.m. We address issues of importance for those of us who live here on the most isolated landmass on the planet. Please come join me Fridays at 3 p.m. Mahalo. Okay, I'm here with Brent Obergaard of the Faculty of the School of Journalism in the Department of Communications at UH Manoa. We've had a number of shows. We have a movable feast going on, and we talk about journalism, we talk about language, we talk about communication in general, and we talk about the effect of that on the country and on individual people. Brent, it's so good to, to be able to discuss this with you in our movable feast. Oh, it's my pleasure. This is a great opportunity. You'll have to come back again and again, okay, deal? Uh, that's the deal. Red Oprah God. I'm Jay Fidel. We care about everything. Thanks. <laughs>
Welcome back to Talk Story with John Wahey and our guest, Dr. Chad Blair. And we were just talking about the fact that maybe over the years, uh, some of members of the press and, and of the uh, political establishment may have gotten to be uh, too friendly with each other. I was talking to someone the other day, and it might have even been you who said this, that back in the day, uh, Jack Burns, right, whose right. son, Judge Jim Burns, just passed away, would actually meet casually with reporters, but it was all off the record. Is that all right? All off the record. In fact, that it used to be uh, he would sit right on the Capitol, right? And especially, well, at first he was at Iolani Palace. Then he would sit right on the front stairs of the Capitol, right where the um, Lili Okalani statue ah, was, yeah. is right now. And reporters would gather around, they would take notes, and he, he would actually talk. The attribution was off the record. <laughs> the substance was open to anything that they wanted to be discussed. Now, Jack Burns, on the other hand, was very much, uh, you know, he didn't hold that many press conferences at, at the same time. But he probably had one of the best informed uh, press scores in, in the country here in Hawaii. We, we're not talking about that now on the national level because the, what you're talking about is deliberately keeping, pe keeping reporting away from the issues that they're interested in. Burns never dodged the issues. He just never wanted to be quoted. <laughs> so after a while, you kind of figured out who was actually saying these things. This is back when guys like Tom Kaufman oh, yeah. doing great work, and Tom's still around today doing books oh, and Bud video. Bud Smyzer, George oh, yeah. Chaplin, all these guys that were, were here. And, and in fact, what, one of the interesting things about back then, we had three separately owned t uh, TV stations. Not only two, two different um, newspapers, but three different... And stations. it's all changed. Now we have three stations owned by one company, and the three main stations are owned by corporate mainland interest, and that's a concern. So, they, but, so what you had was you had CSAFTEL, Bob Berger, right. and I forgot who the other... Uh, you know, they were on doing editorials on their stations, often in uh, opposition to each other. Hmm. Now yeah. it's all about uh, severe weather channel and... What's well, the traffic like? You know, getting <laughs> back to the idea of excluding the uh, denying access, you know, actually Hawaii had a, a similar case. Um, getting back to when, and when Frank Fossey was the mayor, he, um, you know, he had a war with the advertiser. Richard Bereka, was he on the right. advertiser? Uh, no, Richard. Uh, I think it was Star at, Bolton. At, at that time. But he kicked him out of Honolulu. No, I think he was, the, uh, he was with the advertiser. Okay. And, uh, w but, but the argument that Fosse had was that they both were owned on the business side. The joint operating agreement. Right. And he, uh, in fact, I was treated to two hours of why that's a sin with, with, with Frank. And, and, and it, it made sense, but it still was not something that uh, people went along with. They said, okay, no, we, 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 need, two we need two newspapers, not one. Like okay, so what Frank did was he banned Richard Barreca, as you were going to say, from attending his press conferences. <laughs> you know, and uh, so that is a mild version of what is happening now on the federal level. Yeah. The advertiser took that to court and won th the case. And the, our c Supreme Court basically said, you can't deny access. Uh, otherwise, you don't have really have uh, freedom of the press, because access was is an important part of this freedom. How do you think our U.S. Supreme Court, especially one that's going to be five to four again, Republican, would weigh in? Should such a similar case at the federal level? Well, what would happen? Uh, let, let's you and I speculate. Okay, <laughs> so instead of just going to a meeting, all these media. Uh, you know, uh, people got together and said, we're going to file a lawsuit and we're going to do it in California. Hmm. And we're going to come up to, we're going to do it quickly because this is, the, the trip is coming on up. We're going to need an injunction. We're going to need something, right? And, and take it up there, have the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals, get that referred to the, a divided Supreme Court which 4 to 4 says we don't want to hear it. Mm -hmm. Sends it back to the ninth, right? Well, it means that the ruling stands. stands. 
and that becomes the Constitution. But I don't see that kind of aggression. I wonder, though, if such a test might happen. Remember, Trump, as a candidate, said he even wanted to revisit libel laws. Absolutely. I mean, he, of all people, uh, the things that are said, that scares me a great deal uh, as a reporter that what I say, I mean, there's already restrictions on what I can and cannot disclose. I have to be careful about sources, using anonymous sources. I tell you something, though, back to this idea about whether we should be friends with the mm. people that we're covering. Uh, Neil Abercrombie, you know the former governor, we supported him, and he was having a press conference uh, when he was in the <laughs> fifth floor. And I, I've known him. In a fact, long time. Uh, those of us who like Neil often advised him that he should not have as many personal press conferences. I, it might have been wise because he said, <laughs> you know, let's get rid of the Pro Bowl and I'm going to roll over the ARP. But I introduced a new reporter. I said, come along to me to the fifth floor. I'll introduce you to the governor. And, and he went right up and, and asked him a question and said, um, can you tell me about Lanai? We had heard that Lanai was being sold to Larry Ellison. And Neil Abercrombie did not give him a straight answer. And I was writing home with this reporter afterwards who said, the governor of Hawaii just lied to me. And I thought about that for a moment. And I said, that reporter is doing his job. Absolutely. He, is, he is being critical Absolutely. and skeptical. Whereas I was like, hey, this is the governor. Yeah, he's a nice guy. Yeah. But in fact, that's not our job. And that's something that I do think we need to be more careful about. And I say this as someone who... You know, there's too many people that are friends I, in politics. I, maybe, maybe because I, I, I I'm, came from the political background, right? right? Oh, and also lawyers, uh, law, my lawyering background. And so we exist in a world where it's possible to like somebody, <laughs> but totally disagree with them. That's true. You know, and, and totally be, uh, be completely on the other side of an issue. So I don't necessarily see that as... Um, as something, friendships as being something negative. Uh, but if it affects, if your feeling has to be negative in order to say something negative, then maybe as a person, you know. You but know. unlike, a, report, unlike a, a, a lawyer, we're not getting $700 an hour to defend someone we may not yeah, like. See, that's when I started to decide that maybe <laughs> I should have gone back. Unlike a politician, <laughs> we don't have to compromise and trade horses to get legislation So you don't need passed. to be a friend. No. What our job is, is to tell the truth. And if our affection for someone, our loyalties, is interfering with that, then we're failing the people that we're serving. Well, yes, absolutely. But I think you need to distinguish between loyalty and, um, you know, you're, you're telling the truth. Hmm. Uh, I mean, by loyalty and friendship, in other words. Loyalty should not be there if you're a reporter. If you want to be loyal, go work for the guy that's being the, go yeah. that's being the governor. But friendship may actually help you get the story. There's no question that it has, and it continues to do that. I had one editor tell me, John Temple, the founding editor of Civil Beat, uh, worked at the Rocky Mountain News uh, for many years, and he said, even when I wrote a story or we ran a story that was brutal, and he mentioned Ben Nighthorse Campbell. Remember right, the senator? Right, right, right. Native American from right. Colorado, and they ran a brutal story, uh, and it was, which was true. And what John told me was uh, they'll actually respect you more when you just do your job. Job. Even just though you do may think, job. oh, I'm being a jerk and saying well, something bad. He <laughs> says, don't think about that. Report the truth. I, I'll give you an actual case. In, in case. One of my friends now, I mean, I, I consider him a friend, and, and, um, and hopefully he thinks I'm a friend of his, uh, is uh, Richard Baraka, okay? Who was a pain in the butt <laughs> when I was in office. You know, we got to be friends actually after. But I do remember once, this, I remember this instant, and maybe Chuck Friedman, who was my communications director, might, might also remember this. He wrote an article. And actually, the article was one that uh, very few of the other reporters got. But in my opinion, he got it correct. He got what we were trying to do. I don't even remember the subject. So, but I do remember thinking, oh, this, was, you know, this guy's done doing his job. So I get on the phone, and I call him up, and I said, Richard, nice article. What? <laughs> <laughs> you know, nice on, this is absolutely now that's set off an alarm, red flag, yeah, like, what did I do the, wrong? The next day, I get 
uh, totally smashed in, in uh, some uh, report that he was doing. And uh, so Chuck said, that's, you never should mm. ever yeah. tell, at least Richard, he wrote a good article. But, you know, now we have a problem with social media. I wrote an article about a David Ige press conference the other day, and his administration tweeted out the story, which to me is an indication that they liked it. Yeah. And then that made me immediately think, whoops, I, m I might have failed or something. Well, maybe you crossed the line. Yeah. Because, so that, which brings us... Which I don't think I did. Because <laughs> I'm sure my editor is watching no, right I, now. No, <laughs> I'm sure. But, but, but this is what brings us to today. So now we have social yeah. media. Yeah. So we have a president that cuts off all access to what we call the establishment media or, or whatever, how else you want to call it. But he tweets every day. Yeah. So people are beginning to think that instead of reading a newspaper, I follow his tweets. Yeah. And wh how does the system survive in this kind of a context? You bypass the media bypass. altogether to get your message. You know, I don't know if that's going to entirely happen. Even Donald Trump, remember he would actually make up names and call reporters to give them oh, tips yeah, yeah, about yeah, himself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He reads everything that is said about him in the New York Times. The problem is his staff actually tries to give him all positive articles, but he goes out there and he watches the shows and he knows what's there. I think even he realizes he cannot bypass the press because the press, in many ways, made him who but he is he today. But he has two formidable weapons. Yes, he does. And he's taking on a free press. Yeah. And the real question that I had, you know, is which coming full circle, was whether this free press is going to survive. I don't know. Because those two formidable weapons are to pick and choose the businesses you want to support. Right. And the second is to bypass their communication absolutely. Just outright. Right. And because what happens if people stop subscribing to the New York Times? See, what happens at what point does, 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 does the uh, shareholders run into the New York Times and say, look, guys, you know, be nice to them. Well, let me add this positive note on this. The New York Times subscriptions have actually increased substantially. Because, as we, you know, journalism has been losing a lot of, of viewers. Right. But it has actually kicked up. And there is a sense that... This is a rare moment for the press where it has to rise to the occasion and, frankly, take on saving the country. Well, I, I, I think and I'm hoping that the one positive side following up on that is the fact that it may become good business to be against That's the what president. I'm hoping, too. And that's, by the way, that's how Fox, Fox News built itself, exactly. was being against the uh, incumbent. Uh, and then uh, all of a sudden, you know, maybe CNN might be finding it or, or somebody else. But whenever I hear someone say, oh, this news service is biased, or the New York Times or the CNN is too liberal, I think, well, just ask Bill Clinton back when he was president whether they should have covered Monica Lewinsky. I mean, the press gives it as good as it can to just about whoever is in office. Well, hopefully that'll continue, you know, and I didn't think I would actually be saying this, but <laughs> we desperately need a free press. Unfortunately, we're running out of time. I was uh -oh. hoping to take this home and, you know, find out how free is the free press <laughs> in Hawaii. But uh, at this point in time, I want to thank you. Thank you. Very much for being on the program, talking about a very important subject.